everyone, welcome to God's Plan, Your Part, Year 2, where this year we're reading through and studying the entire New Testament, one chapter at a time. Thanks again for joining us in discovering God's plan and your part in it. Today we are officially wrapping up Galatians. It feels like it went very quick, being that we spent a couple weeks in Corinthians, and Galatians is just six chapters, so we've only spent six days in it. Uh, This is a fitting end to Paul's case to the believers in Galatia. And you can see that he is wrapping up some of the threads that he's been pulling throughout the book. I think it's one of the things that stood out to Jenny probably the most. Uh, And he's just trying to, again, remind these folks that the thing that matters is Christ and only Christ. It's not this legalistic approach to doing something to be found faithful before God because of your flesh or your actions. The only way forward is to trust and have faith in Christ so that you are justified before God. And I would say the first thing that's going on a little bit more in this chapter before the final yeah, bit where yep. he is going through pretty much like a, a review of the chapters in his final little paragraph of this chapter, he is talking a lot about what seems to me like it's kind of like this pride thread. Um, so he's like reminding them of being accountable to one another, but yeah. also not to think too highly of themselves because you can get caught in really weird places when you do that. So like correcting each other is very important when you see someone is like out of line, but also to remember not to think of yourself like essentially more highly than you yeah. should because you can fall to the same things that people can keep you accountable for. Um, so it are, it is like this this gentle reminder to be accountable and not prideful in your own itself. It is important to point out, like originally this was just a letter that Paul wrote. So there were not headings, there were not chapters, and he's naturally following following up at the beginning of six on what he finished in five. So chapter five ends in verse 25. If we live by the spirit, let us also keep in step with the spirit. Let us not Mm -hmm. become conceited, provoking one another or envying one another. And then chapter six, verse one, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. So there is, the thought just flows mm-hmm. from the end of the chapter 5 into chapter 6. The idea is that part of walking with the Spirit is humbly correcting other believers, not in a way that puffs up yourself, but in a way that draws um, everyone to honoring Christ over themselves. And I think that's a really hard thing to do it's super hard. even today because I think a lot of times when we hear to correct one another, it's like, well, one, first of all, I can think for myself. When I think of someone correcting me, it's just like, oh, that's mm-hmm. just like, oh, I don't, I don't like that. Um, so it's hard to receive criticism, but it's also, I think, really kind of like put to shame to call someone out anymore. It's like, well, you're just kind of doing your thing. Yeah. I guess like maybe the spirit's speaking to you differently or like it's just kind of like everybody's just taking their own train of thought with this anymore and just kind of doing what they think is best. However, Paul is saying uh, you who are spiritual. So there is something very powerful to people who are mature in their faith um, who have been there for quite some time, I guess even just, I don't know. I don't know how to say that without being like too. Well, meh. it's interesting that you're bringing that up because there is a pretty famous translation issue with the line, you who are spiritual, because it, it has the feeling that there's like this, this group of like super mature people that have a right to correct others. And actually the Greek translated would be more similar to you who have the Holy Spirit. Well, our Bible says too, it doesn't refer to an elite class right. of Christians. It describes right. mature and experienced Christians. And I think that's really, really important. And it, like, I think there can be people who have been in the faith for years that are not mature, but I think that there are others who have been in the faith that actually have taken their faith seriously and are mature Christians that obviously I think would have a little bit more weight in what Mm -hmm. they would hold me accountable to um, than others. So I think that's something to counter in or like to figure in as well. But it's really important that we actually like live this out because it is, I honestly feel like this is so frowned upon today. Mm -hmm. Like it's like this weird touchy subject that nobody wants to like, everybody wants help, but nobody wants help. (laughs) (laughs) And I think that's what he's calling out here. I think it is just to add to your point, popular mainstream Christianity, particularly in the United States, is getting more and more sloppy and more and more um, 
bifurcated. It's like sp- Whoa, what is- split. It's like split up in several different shards and pieces and mm. places. Um, doctrine is less and less understood, and and therefore less and less sharp. And it, it honestly, it's really hard to take this seriously. It's it's really hard to correct people because there's less and less of an awareness of what should be corrected in the first mm-hmm. place. So this, like I've said this a couple of times on the, the podcast, like I think a less and less of a desire for actual growth too. Yeah. So one of our, like, n- n- I don't know, like one of our top secret Christian values has become just acceptance. And that's not really an actual Christian value. So it's like we're, we highlight the fact that we are so accepting and we put up with so many different kinds of silliness. Um, it, it I, In my experience, it's just getting harder to offer correction. And again, in my experience, um, it, it it's hard to actually do this. Okay, and I think... Because it's very common for people to lash out or people to, yes. to try to delegitimize things. I, I've been I've been kind of like... Pro- verbally processing this on the podcast that like recently when I refer to the Bible in conversation or when I offer insight from the Bible, people push it back rubs people the wrong way. and it rubs people the wrong way because less and less people do know the Bible and less and less people know that the, the Bible's very clear on how we should live and how we should handle things. So when you offer that perspective, it's like, ah, I, I, I know a different guy that mm-hmm. has a different perspective. I want to follow him. So this is tough to do. I think also in verse eight, it it fleshes this out a little bit further, but it also references yesterday when we were talking about the gifts of this, or excuse me, um, yeah, the gifts yeah, of the spirit. Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember if that was yesterday, and also if that was what we talked about. Anyway, um, verse eight says, "For the one who, excuse me, the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the spirit." will from the spirit reap eternal life. So it's very interesting. This is very much correlated to yesterday. The, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. It just like, it goes through that whole list from yesterday. Um, and if you're acting on those things, you're not living like with accountability or listening to more Mm -hmm. like mature Christians around you who are trying to help hold you accountable. It's going to be so obvious that when you are living out or sowing to your own flesh, that's what you're going to reap. You will reap corruption, um, which could look like lashing out or not having patience or gentleness to receive those types of accountability. Mm-hmm. It's so interesting. But if you sow to the spirit, the spirit will reap eternal life. You will continue to grow in all of those areas and it won't be something that holds you back anymore. It's just like, it's so funny how it's, it just seems so clear, but it's so hard for us to do. It's interesting that when he, that he highlights um, one way to handle this is just the flesh and the flesh always leads to death. Yep. And it's interesting that the other way to look at this is um, sowing the spirit and the spirit leads to eternal life. So this is a, a life and death situation. And this, this idea of correction is important because when we refuse correction or even when we keep correction to ourselves, like if we see a fellow believer um, being passionate about a wrong choice or a decision that dishonors Christ in their lives, we are sort of by a sin of omission, encouraging them to continue down a path that leads to death. We don't want to do that. And, you know, like heaven forbid we, we, don't speak up because we don't want to be awkward or we don't want to be seen as like rude or something. We're not, we're not being rude. We're encouraging people to pursue a life that honors Christ because we know that eventually that leads to eternal life. Not only does it lead to benefit in this life, it leads to benefit that is eternal life. So we want to encourage people to live godly lives and we should not be shy about that. I think verse nine and 10 are really interesting as well. Uh, This is just like another like added thought. And let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So continuing to hold each other accountable for these things, even if it's hard. Then verse 10, so then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. And I think what's really hard to do today <laughs> is we oftentimes think like we have to appeal to the world well, and we I get think it backwards yeah, yeah I think we have like it's often like we have to appeal to the world 
and like hope that maybe we can like trick someone into believing what we believe. And I think what's really important for us is to live differently, not necessarily like not offensively where we're just in people's faces like, but if someone asks me what I believe, I'm not going to like dance around the truth and hopes that I'm not going to offend someone. Like, I'll tell you what I believe. I'm not going to like shame you and make you feel like a horrible, awful person. I mean, the spirit's going to do that all on his own. Like he's going to call the things out in your life, but I'm not going to shy away from the truth. Our, our, uh, study Bible also mentions that our primary focus should be serving other believers, but not exclude people outside of the church. Like I'm not going to just lie to you, but at the same time, I'm going to be honest about my faith and and yeah, so be it. There, there are like very clear edges you can fall off. Like you, you can become so focused on the household of faith that you've lost your witness. And I'm, I'm not encouraging that. But you can also <laughs> become so focused on the outside of the church that you actually lose the task that is equipping the saints. And that is very dangerous. And, it, and right now it's very popular to do. And what Paul's saying is like, hey, do good to everyone, but especially those in the household of faith. Mm -hmm. So it's like, hey, listen, like when we live to honor Christ, we are being helpful and serving and caring for everyone, but especially those that we call brother, sister in Christ, because we have a common identity, we have a common mission, and and it is like a, a task that has been given to us. One of the ways that we sow life in the spirit is by caring for those in the household of the faith. And one of the ways we care for the household of faith is correcting when there's a miss. That's not the only mm-hmm. way. That's not the only way. Please hear me. But part of it is correction so that we can encourage spiritual maturity across the church. I oftentimes think of like when I was a when I was a teacher, public or private school, whatever. Um, the goal is that you provide excellent education okay, mm-hmm. across the board. So time spent with your teachers and teaching them how to be better teachers We do that often. Mm -hmm. Like we spend days in professional development before the school year starts, throughout the year, all the things. There are also times where we obviously like want to include the parents, we want to include whoever to try to like bring them into the conversation. But like we're not dumping all of our knowledge into the parents. We're dumping the knowledge into the teachers so that the teachers can do what they need to do in the Mm -hmm. classroom and then help the parents along the way. They would not expect the parents to be learning the same things that the teachers are like, that's not the expectation. Um, So it's kind of the same way here. If we dump all of our focus into like only like, I guess, edifying the outside, like only evangelism and not not discipling the church, how is it going to grow to include those others eventually um, with the, the knowledge and I guess the knowledge of God's word Um, the knowledge of who the spirit is, who God is, who Jesus is, if we're not actually taking the time Mm -hmm. to learn. Mm -hmm. So to, to round out the letter, uh, Paul again makes this case. First of all, he, he has this line. I love pointing it out. See with what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. A lot of times these letters are written by like a secretary or, or a servant or something. Um, so this would have actually been his actual handwriting to be like, this is for me. You can see it in my handwriting. Uh, but he rounds out this uh, circumcision argument again, bringing attention to it. Because remember, this is an actual letter written to an actual church. And the problem they were dealing with were these false teachers that were saying you had to be circumcised and follow the law to be justified before God. So that's why he's talking about correcting and restoring people in the beginning of the chapter, because he wants these folks that are falling for this false teaching to be corrected and restored. So this is like direct application within the church. But he draws attention to this in the final thing, saying, hey, we don't boast in our flesh, we boast in Christ. And boasting in Christ is so awesome. There there are many things that are good about all of us. And any time that we try to highlight those those gifts and talents above Christ, it gets out of whack and it looks weird. Uh, any Anytime I've preached a sermon and it went really well and I decided that it was all about me and how awesome I, I am, like, man, I'm such a great uh, speaker. Uh, I'm very talented and skilled. Like, it, it's just gross <laughs> because ultimately I'm only able to do those things because the gift that Christ has given me. And I, I'm not saying you got to like beat yourself up and try to shame yourself when you're when you're not doing something shameful. Like, it's OK to be proud of, of what you've done, um, you know, within reason. But, but ultimately, we want to honor Christ. We want to honor Christ because it is, it's 
Christ that gives us the ability to do those things, and we want to boast in him. So my encouragement is to boast in him. Uh, Just real quickly, there's this weird line that I do want to speak to. Verse 16, and as for all who are, sorry, I'll pick in 15, for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. It's like, wait, what is he talking about? It, um, he has already confronted some of this false teaching that's coming out of Jerusalem that you have to come under the law. Here he's saying the Israel of God, there's a lot of debate about this, but it appears like the Israel of God that he's talking about is like the true Israel of God, those who actually honor God by their their faith in the Lord, those true sons of Abraham that he's been talking about. He's saying the 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 Jews who understand that circumcision is of no value and the Gentiles who understand that, that uncircumcision is of no value, only faith in Christ is of value, is the true Israel of God. So it, it's kind of bringing these two groups together and recognizing them um, as, as these witnesses of God that has always been intended. He already made the case that uh, Abraham was justified through faith. That's where Israel comes from. It's always been faith. So the Israel of God are those that are faithful to his promise. So that's what that means. And then he lands and finishes the letter. So let's round this out. We're at the end of Galatians. What is a good year part for our, I guess, final Galatians chapter, but also specifically for six just in and of itself? I would say for six in and of itself, like pursue um, correction and restoration and reconciliation is so important to who we are because sometimes I get out of line and I need called out and I have had faithful, um, humble folks approach me and correct me. It has been very valuable for my life. So if somebody corrects you, Mm -hmm. receive it. Uh, If you see someone that's out of line or encouraging something that is not honoring Christ, correct it. And, and hopefully they receive it. Like we want to strengthen each other and push each other to a life of boasting in Christ and honoring him because that's how like we honor him when we uh, care well for each other. And then finally, like if there is a big point from Galatians, it is, hey, we are justified by faith in Christ alone. Nothing you do will earn you right standing with God. God has already done it. So when you have faith and trust in Christ as your Savior, you have right relationship with God. And then you're moved to a life of honoring Christ with your life. But those things do not bring you justification. Those things are just how you live out um, thankfulness and praise to God. So that's what I'm leaving you from Galatians. Uh, We'll be back again tomorrow, jumping into Ephesians. I'm looking forward to it. We'll see you then. Hey, before we get into the reading, we want to tell you quickly about Logos Bible Software. It's very helpful to us as we prep for the podcast, and we can offer it to you at a discounted rate. There's two links in our description. One will get you the Logos uh, Fundamentals Pack for 50 bucks, which is a great price. The other one will get you a percentage off any package that you want. We use it often. We think it'll be useful to you. And if you use that link, you'll be helping out the podcast. So go check that out. With that in mind, here's today's reading. Galatians chapter 6. Brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh." But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, 
nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them, and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of God's Plan, Your Part. Don't forget, you can find us on just about every social media platform and YouTube. Let us know what you thought of today's episode, and if you have any questions, go ahead and post them there. You can also reach out to us directly at godsplanyourpart at gmail.com. As always, if you don't have a Bible, or if you'd like to use the one that we use, uh, reach out to us via email, and we'll be happy to send one to you. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you again tomorrow.